Hi, my name is Jolene Underwood, and I am an emotional health coach and a mental health counselor in training. This short presentation is geared for parents and caregivers of adolescents who have been impacted by trauma. In this presentation, I will provide an overview of what happens in the developing brain from childhood to adolescence. I will also share what trauma is and how trauma affects an adolescent brain. Finally, I will highlight beginning steps to foster healing change for you and your child. The brain is quite complex, but for the purposes of this overview, we will focus on three components and when they develop. Development of the brain occurs from the bottom up with the first part being the brain stem. The brain stem operates to keep us alive. It alerts us to hunger. It helps regulate the autonomic nervous system and the brain stem houses our fight, flight, or freeze responses. The limbic system is the first to develop more fully after birth and actively grows to build new networks right away at infancy. Primary growth of the limbic system continues through age six. The limbic system is primarily associated with emotions and motivation. It is commonly referred to as the emotional brain. The last part of the brain to develop is the prefrontal cortex, which is often referred to as the rational or thinking brain. This is the era, area that helps us think abstractly, helps us hold multiple thoughts together, and plan ahead. During adolescence, the prefrontal cortex goes through a restructuring process, which eventually helps the individual fine tune areas of interest and abilities. However, during the construction phase of adolescence, the brain's response to stimuli have a fast track to the limbic system, which again is the emotional center of the brain. As I mentioned, the limbic system can be considered the emotional center of the brain. And in the limbic system, we have the amygdala, which processes information faster than we are aware of. It houses what are called implicit memories or those that we may not be consciously aware of. It also works with the lower part of the brain called the brain stem to activate our natural fight, flight, or freeze responses. This means that when the limbic system is engaged by a perceived threat, it responds immediately. The threat could be something we are not even aware of. It could be something that is held in our unconscious or implicit memories. For a traumatized teen, this could look like sudden emotional reactions to an unknown stimulus. For the parent, their reactions the child's reactions don't make sense to us. Our tendency may be to quickly correct our child's reaction. And the reality is that something likely unknown is causing a reaction in the brain of the adolescent. We may ask, why would you do that? Because we have access to a more developed prefrontal cortex and are likely thinking more critically in that moment. Another part of the limbic system that helps us connect memories is the hippocampus, which helps us remember facts and explicit details. This part of the brain develops, uh, begins around 18 months of age. The lower part of the brain is the limbic system, and it is the part of the brain which is most easily accessed by adolescents, especially when an unconscious memory gets triggered by environmental cues. In early childhood, Limbic development occurs through our interactions with a primary caregiver. When a parent reflects emotions back to a child and responds to the child's needs, the child's brain is soothed and grows healthy attachment. Mirror neurons between mom and child or another primary caregiver and the child, for example, mean that when a baby cries, mom is able to reflect back that the child is crying with a calming presence that allows the child to mirror back a calming response. For example, the child is crying and the mother says, oh, you're sad now. And the mom is mirroring back what the child is experiencing and with her ability to mirror it in a way that doesn't create more emotional engagement, the child is able to work with emotion and engage in a calming response. Mirror neurons impact attachment in early development, but they continue to be a powerful component to human relations throughout our lives which offers hope for parents of traumatized adolescents. Mirror neurons can be an element of conflict or connection. As I mentioned previously, from about age 13 to 25, the pre prefrontal cortex of the brain goes through a restructuring process. There are changes to neural connections, 
um, happening with myelination happening around the brain. And there's also a process called pruning. Pruning reduces the number of synaptic connections formed in childhood that leads to emo emotional regulation. For example, if a child receives an abundant amount of healthy connections through mirroring and attunement in early childhood, the pruning process leaves them with sufficient connections for later use. If the connections are disrupted and minimal, this leaves a child with less internal resources for emotional regulation. During the pruning process, the adolescent brain, again, has fast access to limbic or emotional brain. Is it just hormones? This question of what's going on with our adolescents who are highly reactive and, and their emotions are changing and they have these mood swings, this question was tackled by Dr. Dan Siegel, who says that it's not just a surge of hormones, but that this restructuring part of the brain alters the adolescent's ability to reason well when a stimulus causes the limbic system to activate. Enter trauma. First, let's take a look at what trauma is. According to the Psychotherapy Networker and in an interview with Bessel van der Kolk, trauma is an event that overwhelms the central nervous system altering the way we process and recall memories. Trauma is not the story of something that happened back then, he adds. It's the current imprint of that pain, horror, and fear living inside people. A traumatic event does not always equal trauma responses in a body, and every trauma is a real experience by the nervous system that's been changed by it. According to Nadine Burke Harris in her TED Med talk, trauma impacts the brain in numerous ways, including the following. It affects the pleasure and reward center of the brain, which she says is implicated in substance dependence. It also inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which provides the executive functioning of the body and mind and helps with impulse control. Trauma also physically changes the amygdala and hippocampus in the limbic system, which result in a heightened fear response. From the womb, Trauma can disrupt attachment capacities and rewire the nervous system. Harris also highlights long-term physical health effects like higher risks of COPD and lung cancer, as well as mental health effects like increased depression, anxiety, and suicidality. Normal adolescent challenges are heightened in the traumatized brain. This fast access to the limbic system that occurs in normal adolescent minds means that less logical thinking and there's less logical thinking that's happening and more emotional sensitivity. This leads to challenges in the brain that are normal for most adolescents and they're exacerbated in adolescents with trauma. These include sensitivities to facial responses, quick reactions to situations that are connected to past events, which they may or may not even be aware of. For example, if a caregiver was angry and treated the child harshly, the child may develop a fear response of fight or flight. By the time a child is in adolescence, the tra any traumatizing verbal abuse from the past can elevate the charge of emotional reactivity in the present if a caregiver uses a tone or a facial response that even slightly resembles the past event. This causes the adolescent to react in anger or shut down. Due to mirror neuron activity, the teen's anger can trigger anger in the parent, which then perpetuates a destructive cycle. The teen gets angry because they felt slighted by something the parent did or didn't do, and then the parent is upset and looking at their teen like, what, what's going on with you? Why are you reacting so strongly? And then their anger escalates. The adolescent brain, as I mentioned before, is going through this restructuring process in the free prefrontal cortex, which means that the logic and reasoning center sometimes goes offline as the limbic system is in high gear. This elevates risk-taking behavior and compromises a sense of judgment. For traumatized adolescents, these normal occurrences may be elevated as the nervous system and limbic system are set to remain in fight or flight mode without thinking ahead rationally. Pairing adolescents comes with a unique set of challenges for everyone, but with trauma, some of these concerns become escalated too. You may see your child as irresponsible. Their actions may seem highly illogical. They may have emotions that seem intense and they may isolate further, either from the family or from all people who could be a positive influence in their life. What happens then? 
To highlight what is happening in the brain for you and them, Dan Siegel uses a hand to show different areas of the brain. If you make a fist like, like he's showing there in the picture, uh, you've got your thumb underneath the fingers and the fingers closed over the thumb. So consider the lower part of your palm and wrist to be the brainstem. Again, this is where the fight or flight response resides. With your thumb pressed up against the inside of your hand, notice that this is like the amygdala, where the joint of the thumb sticks out, and the hippocampus from the rest of the thumb. These are the limbic regions that develop after the brainstem and work with the brainstem by regulating emotions and motivation. Your fingers are representative of the, of the prefrontal cortex. When they are connected or online, we have access to higher functions like reason and thinking ahead. When they're offline, we are operating out of our limbic or emotional brain. Watch this short video by Dr. Siegel that represents what happens for parents as well as children when the limbic system is highly activated. So that if you put your thumb in the middle of your hand and put your fingers on the top, it's a pretty handy model of the brain. And these prefrontal areas we're talking about are right here in the middle. And how many of you are parents in the room? Okay, so this is the area that allows you to kind of keep your body balanced, emotional is balanced, attuned to other people, be empathic, have self-understanding, have morality, all that beautiful, wonderful, integrative stuff. But how many of you, just be honest, as a parent have ever flipped your lid, <laughs> right? And Mary Hartzell, my co-author of Parenting from the Inside Out is here, let's hear it for Mary. So. Mary and I uh, wrote a book, uh, Parenting from the Inside Out, which explores how you flip your lid and how terrifying that can be for kids. And in our experience running workshops for parents, what we found is that when you teach them about the brain, they can stop the self-blame that shuts down their going toward their kids to help them make sense of what happened. So instead of being so ashamed of what I did and so shut down, I actually say, okay, I understand. I flipped my lid. My prefrontal region went offline. How do I go back and make sense? of what happened. As a parent, you may feel like you or your child are hanging on by a thread because there have been so many events with relational friction and tension. Maybe there's been a buildup of situations where the adolescent is quick to react to your words, your body language, your facial messages, your tone, or your phrases of even just simple phrases. You may feel like you're on your last nerve because now you feel highly reactive too. Bessel van der Kolk in his book, The Body Keeps a Score says that we need a sense of feeling, says if you lack a deep memory of feeling loved and safe, the receptors in the brain that respond to human kindness may simply fail to develop. If that is the case, how can people learn to calm themselves down and feel grounded in their bodies? I would say that this starts with us. As parents, we can identify ways that we may have our bodies already stirred up and need to work to get them calmed down so that we can provide neuron activity for our children where they're able to see us containing strong emotions and not reacting back and forth with them. All of us need a sense of feeling held and loved in another person's mind to nurture healthy attachment. Although your child may have trauma in the past that includes feeling unloved and unsafe, you as the parent have an opportunity to provide safety for your child. As the child feels safer, they may still have reactions that are hard to manage because they're not used to the feeling, but don't give up. They just may not have that repertoire in their minds yet. But again, through that mirror activity and through other steps, which I'll show you next, you can build in a sense of safety and a sense of being loved that will help their bodies to calm down. As I mentioned before, it begins with us. Now that we've covered a very brief overview of what's happening in the brain, where can you start? How can you set the course for you and your adolescent child to be different and more adaptive or responsive in the future? First, we have, something, have to have something in ourselves in order to give it to another person. By choosing to work on any past trauma you may have and identifying any, any emotional triggers you have, you can begin noticing what's happening in your body and the responses that you have that aren't about, your about you, but are about your child and what's going on with them. You may need to identify what the, circumstance, what the circumstances are that cause emotional reactions in you, then engage in your personal work to heal from past wounds. 
Also, understanding your attachment style can be helpful as you identify patterns of thought and behavior related to attachment deficits. Attachment deficits look like avoidance or really wanting to be close to someone and then fearing being close to them. Different ways that we struggle to speak our needs and ask for them to be met and to experience them being met and be vulnerable with another person. If you notice that you're having significant patterns of uh, challenges, EMDR is a powerful therapy method that reduces charged emotional reactions, which could be something beneficial for you and your child, depending on your needs and your situation. In the parenting situation, limits, boundaries, and consequences are still important. They're just not the end all. And when our kids are really little, we need to give them clear instructions to not do something or to do something and give them guidance and, and opportunities to see us engaging in action and what it's like to, to behave a certain way. So those um, limited boundaries are still appropriate. Um, children, our adolescents also need the structure and safety of knowing um, where they stop, where their actions um, are not okay because they're harming other people. But again, it's not the be all end all. One way that you can begin to strengthen attachment is through a process called attunement. And when you think of attunement, think of uh, two instruments that are playing side by side. And if you hear completely different um, musicians with their different styles going in whatever song, it's going to clash. It's going to be harsh. It's going to uh, make, maybe make the nervous system all jumpy. And attunement finds a way to find that harmonizing piece. What notes are you playing? What notes are, did mine go with you? And so what emotion is the child experience and what, uh, and how can I meet my child with their emotional experience? One way to do that is to offer presence. Simple things like eye contact and just staying engaged in the conversation to engage being present with the child and what's going on with them. Not focused on all the other activities, not focused on the other children at that time, but working on that one adolescent and staying present with them. And as they're sharing, validate and hear their responses. You don't have to agree with their responses to validate it. They may say some things that are really frustrating and they might say some things about you as a parent that immediately your emotional reaction would be, well, that's not true, that's not fair, how dare you think that? And those are areas that we need to step back as the parent and reflect on and work on for ourselves. In the moment of learning to attune and spending time engaging in attunement with our children, that validation is really important. And in the process, the mirror neurons here can be used for connection as they see that we're not flipping our lid and going offline because of something they've said or an action that they took. They're able to know that their big emotions are safe and they're able to see that calming response coming from our body and that compassion that comes back and forth to the child. Ways that can help us do that is uh, mindfulness and breathing exercises. We can engage in mindfulness activities. Um, there's plenty of apps and uh, videos online that may guide you through a process, um, whether it's focusing on breath work, the breath going in and out and allowing your body to calm down or just noticing the environment that you're in. These activities can be done individually, but also even with your child. Maybe they're very um, highly reactive in the moment and you can validate their experience. Okay, hey, you feel, I, I, you're angry right now. Let's take a deep breath and model that experience for them. And as they see you do it, that also will be an opportunity for them to see what, it, what happens when mindfulness and breathing work um, helps a body calm down. And another way to strengthen attachment is to remember connection over correction. Yes, there's times when we're still training our children and we need to correct things that are going on or correct thought patterns or whatever. We may need to say some of that. But at this point in parenting, it's really more about influence. It's not about control. It's about negotiating, not dictating our way over their way. The goal in, is building attachment and that connection so that you have more influence in their life when they're making decisions and so their brains are able to receive and move in that direction. Just a reminder that these are just beginning steps. This is an overview video. It's steps to an adaptive, responsive path. 
not reaction, not highly emotionally reactive. These steps will help you move towards healthy adaptive responses with your child so that they can learn healthy adaptive responses as well. It's one step at a time. And I provided an additional uh, handout for you to give you resources that will just kind of further this work and take it to the next step. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me at Jolene, or I'm sorry, joe at joleneunderwood.com. Thank you for listening to this presentation, and I hope it's helpful as you parent the adolescent child or teen who uh, has experienced trauma. Take care.